Okay. Good morning, and welcome all of you to the <coughs> morning session of the last day of these workshops. Do it. And in the morning session, we will have four talks. Uh, most all of them are the some sorts of review. So the first talks uh, by the Professor Shekhar Sivakula. He will talk about the physics in what was discussed in the snow mass in US platforms. Okay, Shekhar, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the workshop organizers and speakers and everyone here for a wonderful workshop. I have the dubious privilege of turning from three wonderful days of science to starting to talk about policy and planning. So uh, my job is to tell you a little bit about what happened at the Snowmass uh, US planning exercise. Okay, so I'm gonna start and um, for to set the stage by talking about the last planning exercise to give you a sense of what the purpose was and what the outcome was so you can see uh, how that worked. Uh, so the last planning exercise actually occurred in 2013, so uh, nine years ago. Uh, it, it was the culmination of a year-long effort uh, with a conference at uh, in uh, Minneapolis or uh, snow mass on the Mississippi, the Mississippi River starts in Minneapolis. Uh, and during that time, the US community came together. Uh, everyone was invited to participate um, and not just in the US, but physicists from abroad as well. There were many participants from abroad. Uh, the fundamental way of participating was to get involved in one of the working groups. The areas of physics were divided into topical groups or working groups to submit. Uh, white papers uh, for consideration by those working groups. And then the topical groups got together and worked before the meeting. And then at the meeting, everyone got together and tried to come up with a consensus. And I use that word advisedly. This is not a recommendation. It's not a you know, prioritization. It's a consensus about the science. What are the important areas of the science? Oh, that's not me, good. Uh, the important areas of the science that need to be uh, covered in a future US program. And the time period in particular was sort of the next decade. Um, so how did that go? Uh, so the year, the, the, it culminated in that, that meeting, the topical groups wrote reports, there was an executive summary, uh, which you can find at that, uh, at that URL. And that laid out a roadmap of the scientific opportunities that were available. And then that fed into a very important uh, government planning process in the United States, the Particle Physics Project Prioritization Panel, lots of P's, P5. Uh, and this is a sub-panel of the High Energy Physics Advisory Panel, HEPAP, which is the primary government uh, um, uh, committee, which which advises the Department, US Department of Energy and the US National Science Foundation on particle physics, broadly uh, speaking. There's an analogous uh, body, uh, NSAC for nuclear physics, for example. And so there, there's a number of these uh, government advisory committees. Now, they had the uh, job of taking the consensus and actually applying some moderate reality filters, actually to think about budgets, think about what could actually fit into a program over the following decade. Uh, and that would feed into you know, scientific research directions for high energy physics and in particular federal funding profiles and rec requests over the coming uh, decade. Uh, so they came out with their report in uh, May of 2014. I think very importantly, they, uh, I think very effectively packaged the science drivers, as they call it, into sort of five relatively pithy statements, which I think still stand up pretty well as the sorts of uh, questions that we are interested in. There's some, you know, some debate, of course, about exactly how you word these and which, and, uh, the order is not, by the way, meant to be significant, so that's not a problem. Uh, they came up with recommendations. They prioritized projects according to various funding scenarios. Um, and uh, as you'll see, I think it was very, very impactful in the, in the last decade in uh, actually uh, uh, setting priorities. Now, very importantly, the process didn't end there. It wasn't just that the report was written, handed off to HEPAP, and that was it. The community stayed engaged in the process, and every year, uh, after its uh, publication, uh, especially led by Steve Ritz and others in, uh, in usparticlephysics.org uh, and the user groups from the uh, USLHC collaborations and other collaborations, every year they put together 
a sort of a two-page set of talking points about, uh, you know, in, uh, about the, the, the great discoveries and progress that was made in the last year and uh, re-establishing what were the priorities year by year. And these documents were then used by the high energy physics community during its visits to Congress or the executive branch to talk about and to stay on the same page and stay coordinated with a message about high energy physics. And so it's, it's, a, it, it's an ongoing process. How well did it work? Well, so a little bit of US budget uh, talk here. Um, there are, uh, there's the, the uh, president's budget, which is in purple. And then there's what's actually appropriated in, in budget speak in the United States. Appropriation means real money that you can spend. Authorization, which you sometimes hear about, uh, that along with five currency units will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Uh, so the, the uh, appropriation is the actual appropriating of the funds that can be spent. And uh, here were the two years prior to uh, the P5 report really taking effect because FY 2014 starts in the middle of 2013, right? And you'll see the US high energy physics, this is the DOE budget in particular, US high energy physics budget was around $800 million at that period. Uh, P5 was asked to consider two funding scenarios, the red and the blue lines, which are the, the, they were asked to say what kind of program could fit in those blue and red lines. Uh, the actual amounts that were ap appropriated are these green, button, green uh, 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 points. And you'll see that uh, by 2021, uh, the last time that we have a full authorization, that's almost you know, $300 million higher than it was where we started. So especially given the political environment that we were dealing with, I think that's a, a remarkable uh, success. Um, and so from the feedback that we get when we go to Congress and, and from the executive branch, the fact that the high energy physics community in the United States was able to establish a, a priority, stay on message uh, and talk with a unified voice made a big difference. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition though, of course, but we need to have that I think in order to get to, uh, to, to have the possibility of that. Now this enabled all sorts of, I think important um, agreements, including international funding agreements with, oops, with, uh, with India, for example, that we, we heard about, uh, as well as CERN and, and, and others. And, and so that it, it's, it's important, not just for the, for the uh, US physics, but it also you know, set the stage for US collaboration globally. So that was important. Okay, now, where are we now? And this is actually uh, you know, a budget, a slide shown at Snowmass from Harriet Cohn, who was the uh, associate director of the department, uh, the, sorry, the uh, Office of Science. Um, and this shows in font that's so small that you can't read, different projects uh, that were uh, prioritized by P5. In green are the projects that are actually uh, you know, taking uh, data or doing analysis. Uh, this is a timeline going from 2013 to 2024. Uh, blue are, let's see, let's see, blue are those that are under, uh, uh, under uh, construction. Yellow are, those, yellow are those that are uh, conceptual, under conceptual consideration and design. And you'll see that an enormous number of projects have moved to the right and from the conceptual design to the uh, to the actual operation uh, uh, phase. So just so you, you know that things weren't left out, uh, HLLHC accelerator upgrade is here, HLLHC detector upgrade is up here. And so you can see that's in, firmly in the blue phase, right? Moving towards uh, deployment as, we, as we've heard. Now, so that was, uh, that was the result, I think, of this exercise of being able to uh, have a consistent message and succeed, I think, in showing that we, uh, we're worthy of um, uh, the trust of, of, uh, of, our, of our fellow citizens to, to do good science. And in order to have, well, so where do we go from here? In order to have a good program, you need a mix of projects, right? And you need projects that are being conceived, you need projects that are being constructed, you need projects that are that are uh, that are uh, doing uh, that are doing science. So we have an opportunity here, as we come to the end of this decade, to plan for the next ten years about what kinds of projects and what kinds of uh, what how we want to structure, in, in essence, high energy physics in the coming uh, decade. Now. Having said that, while the P5 exercise will focus on the next decade, we actually know that we're talking about 20 and 30 year time horizons in some case. So we have to have some consideration that many of these projects are gonna go on even longer than that. All right, 
So that's the, that was the purpose for SNOMAS 2021, in a sense, to repeat this exercise, to bring the US high energy physics community together, to arrive, uh, you know, to analyze the scientific opportunities, the progress that had been made in the field over the last decade, and to be able to uh, produce a consensus document that would then go forward into another P5 process, and hopefully another 10 years of, uh, of, of um, a robust funding for, for high energy physics. So that was the, that's the goal. Now, uh, you may wonder why this was titled SNOMAS 2021, and I'm talking to you in, Snow in 2022, and uh, the meeting actually happened in 2022. It's because we had a year's delay uh, due to COVID. We actually started the exercise in the summer of 2020. We were all optimistic or hopeful that 2021, we'd be able to still be able to meet in person, be able to conclude the exercise. But of course, uh, globally, the pandemic lasted much longer. And that was particularly difficult uh, for our younger colleagues, especially those who are caregivers who have uh, children. Um, and uh, so we took the uh, opportunity to, to take a pause for seven months. Uh, and to uh, sort of, we postponed the meeting uh, for one year. It turned out that because of the effect of COVID on, uh, on projects for the funding profiles of things, this essentially was a wash because projects were delayed many in many cases by about a year. So we're still roughly in the same uh, relative time. So SOMAS 2021, we had these 10 frontiers. Uh, you can read them for uh, yourself. Um, we had 30 frontier conveners, many of whom were international conveners, not just from the United States. 250 topical groups, each of those, uh, each of those uh, frontiers uh, had different uh, working groups. We had inner frontier liaisons and we had special early career liaisons. That culminated in a study that happened then, or a meeting rather in July, uh, July of this year. Um, and you know, great thanks to Gordon Watch and Shi uh, Chi Su, who some of you may may know, who really organized that. Um, they swear they will never do it again, but they pulled it off this year. Um, so, just in terms of uh, participation, as a, one measure of success, we had over 700 participants in person. For almost everyone I spoke to, that was their first in-person conference or workshop since the pandemic had, had started. Uh, I, I've seen several people here who participated, Frank, for example, and others. Uh, we had a, a you know 650 virtual participants. That's a little bit hard to track, but that's the number of registrations. And they actually had to, if, if you were uh, if you were a more senior scientist, you actually had to pay something. So it, it meant something. Uh, we had press and local volunteers. So we had almost 1,400 uh, participants. And one measure, of, another measure of our success is we only had 35. Uh, confirmed COVID cases during that uh, workshop. So people, I think the community really came together and you know observed masking protocol and all that sort of thing. So what was the output? Uh, well, you've seen much of the output here. I, I, I lost track after the first day. I was keeping track of how many times SNOMAS white paper appeared on slides, but I, I lost track. Uh, there were you know, over 500 white papers that were submitted, uh, 80, almost 80 topical group reports. Uh, 10 frontier summaries that are almost complete. Um, these are written documents summarizing the consensus that was arrived at by a given frontier. Uh, by next week, almost, they should all be public on the archive. Rough, roughly half of them are already on the archive. Um, uh, the, the rest of them should be in short order. And we're very busy uh, preparing the executive summary. Uh, our initial plan was to get all of this done by the end of October. Well, best laid plans, you know how that works, but we should be getting that done uh, quite, quite soon. Okay, Vladimir needs help. Okay. So it's not possible for me in 30 minutes uh, plus five to, to give you a sense of all of the recommendations or discuss all of the outcomes. Um, so I'm gonna give you instead just sort of a, a sampling of them from the different frontiers. Uh, these are just diagrams to say that people actually had nice diagrams. This is a dark matter diagram. You've seen a version of this uh, in different, uh, different uh, uh, talks here. This is the energy frontier trying to summarize the different questions that it can answer. And this is the neutrino frontier showing the wide diversity of effort in different neutrino uh, experiments. And this is actually a timeline and in type that's so small, even on the full size slide, you can't really see it. Uh, they uh, list all of the different neutrino experiments that people are involved in just to show that they have done their, their homework. So let me give you a sense of some of the, uh, 
I will use the word recommendation, but we tried to be careful to talk about these as conclusions. Really, P5 is the one that's ultimately going to get recommendations. Let me give you a sense of the recommendations having to do with the larger experiments in the different frontiers. So the cosmic frontier really had three major thrusts, you know, studies of the cosmic microwave background, spectroscopic surveys, line image mapping, and then, of course, associated but not purely high energy physics is gravitational wave observatories. And they have uh, CMBS-4, the, the sort of next generation of cosmic microwave background experiments is the next, uh, it's a telescope array, but anyway, is the next uh, uh, big priority of that field that's getting underway. And then they're moving towards the next generation in the, uh, in the um, spectroscopic surveys and the line uh, image mapping surveys. And, and this one in particular had to coordinate with the Astro 2020 survey that was also had just uh, been uh, been finished. And so we use some NASA speak here, Pathfinder means to pilot experiments to actually you know, understand how to, how to build the experiment. Uh, the energy frontier is probably the most directly applicable here. So let me spend a minute on this. Uh, the priorities of the energy frontier include, uh, you know, fast start for construction of an E plus C minus Higgs factory. I think that's very much in line with the European strategy study and what we've heard here too. Um, one difference I would point out is that while the European strategy survey, as we heard, has a plan A and a plan B with plan A being FCCEE and plan B being some other thing. Uh, the US community was not willing to make a prioritization of FCCEE over uh, the others. So um, the, at, the, at this point, um, the community is interested in pursuing or seeing what can be done in, in potentially any of these options. Um, but to be ready to really participate, they want to uh, have targeted research and development for detectors at, the, uh, at, at a Higgs factory. Uh, so that, that I think you know, goes quite well with what's going on globally. Uh, and then, you know, this sort of goes along with the fact that there are other potential Higgs factories being considered, R&D towards understanding if the costs for a Higgs factory can be lowered and whether it's even possible to site a Higgs factory in the United States, perhaps at the Fermilab site. Uh, and then uh, for the longer term, as we have seen, sort of request, you know, targeted R&D for uh, multi-TEV colliders, as opposed to generic accelerator R&D. You'll see more of that uh, when I talk about the accelerator frontier. So that's the energy frontier and heavy flavor uh, in rare and precision. At least these are the heavy flavor factories, you know, continued participation in uh, LHC, both Atlas and CMS, as well as LHCB, participation in, in Bell 2, uh, and potentially also participation in, in uh, accelerators in China. Uh, and then, of course, there's a, a fairly, not shown on this slide, there's a big investment in the US community in Mu2E at Fermilab. In the neutrino frontier, um, this one uh, you heard about Dune. Uh, uh, LBNF Dune is the is the highest priority of the neutrino frontier. That that project has been divided into two stages, as you've heard. Phase one uh, consists of the civil facilities, or the, rather the excavation at SURF for up to four caverns for four different detectors. Uh, it, it's the uh, you know LBNF. Uh, 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 beamline at Fermilab, uh, the 800 MeV proton uh, accelerator, uh, and, a, and a somewhat curtailed near detector program at Fermilab. That's phase one. The price tag for phase one in total, including contingency, is $3 billion. Uh, and it's the first, um, well, uh, it's, 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 a, uh, it's going to be the first truly international collaboration in many ways at Fermilab and in, in the United States. So that's an important milestone. Now, Phase one is not sufficient to answer all of the questions that uh, we heard about. It was, I think it was yesterday in the Dune uh, talk. And so uh, phase two is the, the next thing that the neutrino frontier would like to see happen. That includes finishing the FAR detectors at, uh, at, at uh, Sanford, the other two detectors, the other half, uh, and finishing the near detector complex and upgrading the proton accelerator to increase the intensity of the beam. Uh, so there is a possibility, given the delay in the other two detectors at, uh, at, at Sanford, at, at SURF, that the other two, the technologies for the other two detectors could be different, and they could be better, and they could be better at doing things beyond just neutrino physics as well. So that's being uh, pr uh, pursued. Uh, and then there's a portfolio of small and mid-scale neutrino uh, uh, programs that they're considering. 
Now, in addition to those sort of physics, experimental physics frontiers, there were other frontiers, including uh, theoretical physics, accelerator physics, and underground physics. Theoretical physics, really, we're looking for um, a commitment much like was made in the European Strategy Study, sort of recognizing the importance uh, of a healthy and broad theory program, including aspects of computational theory, uh, formal theory, as well as phenomenology or uh, experimentally motivated theory, and, and understanding that a, that a healthy ecosystem that, in, that, that supports all of those is important uh, for, the, for, for the health of the field. Uh, accelerator physics, I think these uh, recommendations actually closely align with uh, those on the energy frontier and as well as those in the neutrino frontier. Uh, in addition to research on the you know, upgrade of the proton driver at, uh, at, at Fermilab, um, the, the, the biggest uh, recommendations were sort of having an integrated future collider R&D program. If we have all of this menu of different colliders, uh, making sure that accelerator physics in the United States is organized in such a way that it explores those possibilities in a coherent way that allows us to actually, frankly, I think, be in a position, for example, when the uh, updated European strategy comes out toward the end of this decade to be able to actually you know, participate. And then have an active, continue the active uh, uh, generic uh, R&D program for accelerators uh, as well. Um, in addition to the excavation at, uh, so in turn, this is the underground frontier, uh, the excavation going on now uh, for the uh, uh, dune caverns, the four dune caverns, we have the opportunity at this point to potentially do other excavation at, since all the, you know, the digging apparatus is already below ground uh, for, for example, a third generation dark matter detector or other possibilities. So that's something that the underground frontier wants to make sure is considered and is on the uh, table. Uh, this instrumentation frontier um, recommendation has basically to do with funding research and instrumentation. That's a, th that's a theme I'll come back to uh, later, but uh, that's, that's their primary recommendation. And then in computation, as we heard earlier, there's a lot of important uh, supporting computational software that crosses multiple experiments and crosses both the design and the implementation and the analysis phase of experiments and some sort of a, a greater coordination as opposed to simply having computation associated with each experiment. It may still be mostly with each experiment, but still having a coordination across those areas was felt to be uh, an important uh, priority. Finally, um, one of the novel aspects of uh, uh, SNOMAS 2021 in the United States is, a, is the formation of a separate community engagement frontier, which considered a wide variety of topics. Often when one says community engagement, one either talks about, thinks about public education or outreach, or perhaps diversity, equity, and inclusion. But as you can see, the frontier actually considered uh, all of those areas. And one of the things that I think is going to be very interesting going forward, and, and is quite frankly, a challenge is to understand, you know, who's responsible for these different things and how do we actually try to get some of this uh, done? So that's, a, that's something that we're gonna have to work on uh, going forward. So where are we now in terms of formation of the new P5? The last day of the Snowmass workshop, Joanne Hewitt announced that Hitoshi Murayama from UC Berkeley will be the chair of the next P5 panel, taking over from, uh, from Steve Ritz. Um, the plan, so we don't yet have a charge. Uh, any official subpanel of the High Energy Physics Advisory Panel has a charge which defines the questions and the scope of their deliberations, the questions they consider and the scope of their deliberations. We don't have that charge yet, as I'll explain in a minute, uh, but this was uh, Harriet Kung's sort of uh, recommendation of the sorts of things that she thought that, that P5 should consider. And I wanna point out here that this one in particular, a research program to deliver science, I think is a very important one. You might wonder what is research doing in a project physics, phys, particle physics project prioritization panel? Well, what's happened over the last year, you saw that 30% rise in the budget, that was wonderful. But with our emphasis on projects, in many ways, what's happened is the research part of the portfolio for theory, for accelerator and instrumental development has deteriorated in actual real dollars, not in, in sorry, in nominal dollars, not just inflation adjusted dollars. And so uh, there certainly was a, a very strong consensus of our community. There needs to be a balance between those things because those things form the basis of being able to do the uh, projects and find this, do the science in, in, in the long term. Uh, 
Um, so there has been some actual recent good news since uh, Snowmass, just to, to, to say we don't all have, it's not all bad news. Uh, the somewhat mysteriously named Inflation Reduction Act had uh, $304 million of appropriation. Again, I put that in all caps because that's real money. $304 million for high energy physics that can be spent immediately and is uh, for the next five years, over the next five years. So that's going to be used in various ways. I don't yet know, I mean, uh, uh, there's gonna be a heat map meeting in December. I think we'll find out more about what high energy physics is doing with that. I would say this doesn't even include, um, I forget how much is coming to EIC, 60 million or something for, for the Inflation Reduction Act. So there's another, there's another separate amount that's going to EIC also from that. There's a, uh, and then the Chips and Science Act, along with other things, recommends increases in NSF and DOE. That's more on the authorization level. That's not, that's a promise. That's not actual uh, money. Okay, so this was the original plan. To, to have everything, you know, have not nominations actually were due August 22nd and to start deliberations, P5 was supposed to start deliberations this fall. Everything got delayed for reasons that will become obvious in a moment. Uh, the charge itself, for example, has not yet been settled and it will be, we think, unveiled at the next TPAP meeting on December 8th. So that's, uh, that's sort of the next step. Once that's done, I think the panel will be impaneled in short order. And uh, while we may not be able to, to, to finish by summer, we hopefully to be able to finish by early fall, if not uh, before. So there's been a major change in the personnel. Uh, thank you. There's been a major change in the personnel overseeing high energy physics at the Department of Energy. Jim Segrist, who is the director of the uh, Office of High Energy Physics, uh, retired. And Gina Ramika from uh, uh, Fermi Lab is going to be taking over and took over, I think, on November 8th, so a week ago. So that's the part of the reason why things were, were delayed. And uh, uh, so we expect now things to move in a more normal schedule. That's not all. We can never do things in ones in the United States. We either do none or three or four. So we're doing three this time. Uh, there's also an international benchmarking subpanel, uh, which is, I think, among other things, considering, for example, how good a place is the United States to do international collaboration. If we're going to be a host uh, nation to, for a real substantial international collaboration, how can we better be better at that? Uh, and what are the what are the prop, what are the uh, characteristics of the field we need to to work on for that to happen? Also, the National Academies of, of Science every uh, decade does a survey of particle physics, and they have been uh, looking carefully at our snow mass output, and we'll be using that. But their report presumably won't come out to 2024, uh, so that's coming. Um, I'm going to go over these uh, quickly. I've pretty much said all of these. Uh, I mean, I think the lessons from the last P5 process where that, uh, you know, a consistent message from the community that really is, is coherent is, is extraordinarily important and has the opportunity to actually uh, get funding with it. And in the coming decade, we really need to understand how to balance our, our focus on research with that on projects. Um, the plan, uh, there's you know, continued strong support for the plan that was, that was established, HLLAC, Dune Phase One, LSST, among others. You know, so I think it's fair to say the last plan succeeded and that we have the elements of a new successful plan, and that's what we have to execute on now. Um, there are some US-specific issues I think we need to address. I can talk about those later, but you'll have those in the slides because I wanted, uh, Rohini asked uh, that, um, we think a little bit about the topic of this actual uh, workshop. So uh, with that in mind, I, 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 I have a few preliminary thoughts and questions about the high energy physics program in, in India. I, I should say, these are really questions. This is not, you know, by no, in no, by no stretch of the imagination should this be construed as conclusions about, about anything. I'm just trying to raise questions that I think might be interesting. Uh, to, to discuss, and uh, but I, I have the uh, I have the benefit of of, of really learning from the excellent participation uh, part, uh, presentations we've had here. Now, in the near term, where near term now means the next ten years, uh, I think the U.S. and Indian HEP program are very well aligned. I don't 
can't imagine them being even better aligned than, you know, we've seen the priorities, HLLHC and LHC, LBNF, Dune, Bell 2. We've seen those are exactly the same priorities as the US program and the European program too. I think everything is, is very well aligned. And I think that the sort of poster child, if you wish, of, uh, of, the, of, of a, a really fruitful collaboration that we're having between the United States and India is the sort of PIP2 800 MEV proton uh, driver, where you can see that you saw this slide with all the contributions from, from India. I think that's extraordinary. And the question then is really, you know, how do we maintain and grow these kind of fruitful global collaborations in the face of the changing, rapidly changing and fluctuating domestic and international conditions that we're all seeing, right? I, I think that's a, that's a challenge. In the intermediate term, global Higgs factory, we, we heard this uh, during, the IELTS, the, during the linear collider uh, accelerator talk, right? How can we resolve this chicken and egg problem that has plagued the ILC? You know, after you, Alphonse, if, if, you, if you go forward, I'll join you, but I, you won't go forward if I don't, okay. So what do we, how do we get out of that? And, and in many ways, I think that, you know, that really is gonna be the central issue for us in intermediate, in the intermediate term, globally for high energy, high energy physics, right? How do we how do we move forward on it? And our future really do, does depend on it. In the long term, um, now here's this slide. This was actually a slide that Fabiola Ginaldi showed at at, uh, at Snowmass uh, of FCCEE, and it basically was shown here as well. And you'll notice that um, the the sort of depending on your point of view, this is optimistic or pessimistic. The uh, the start of FCC operation, FCC -E, e operations is the middle of this century. You tell that to somebody that's a postdoc or a graduate student and they say, I'm gonna be older than you are now, right? So how do we collaborate to create a vibrant global program that retains the brightest scientists and provide them with the continuous scientific and professional opportunities they're gonna need over the next 50 years, right? I think that's going to be our long-term issue that we have to solve. Now, rather than ending on a downer, let me just say, these are really difficult questions to answer. And luckily we don't have to do these today. We don't have to answer them at four o'clock. Um, and I think it would be bad actually, you know, when you're planning for the next three or four years, okay, so maybe you have a prospect of really doing a detailed plan. If you're planning for the next 50 years, the future is built incrementally and it's it's determined often by contingencies we don't even see now and we've had no better example of that than the last three years right with COVID and ukraine and, and other things nonetheless i think we understand that having strong scientific priorities doing the doing the work and the re basic research that we need to be able to take advantage of opportunities as they arrive and move in the, ourselves in the right direction does have, I think, the prospect of, of succeeding. And so that's what we really uh, need. In addition, I think it's uh, especially reasonable to uh, appropriate to say here that our past successes were built on global scientific and human connections, right? If I just, I, I just did a little bit of Googling, right, for, for collaboration between India and CERN, right? There's a, a agreement back in 1991, which sort of a major formal agreement between the DAE and, and, and CERN and associate membership in 2016. With the United States, uh, it, in collaboration goes even further back, we heard about it. But, you know, this sort of Project X collaborative agreement in 2011, we've seen the fruition or seeing the fruition of that now, uh, you know, 11 years later with, uh, well, it's gonna continue for the next decade for building the, the proton driver. So these are the kinds of things I think that really help having you know, a, a collaborative and a coherent scientific vision that's backed up by the connections that actually allow us to work together uh, is I think extraordinarily important. And I think this workshop is a great example of that. So with that, I think I will conclude with a picture of a mountain. Thanks, Karen. Excellent talk. I do not think that you expected the beta talk in 30 minutes to conf confine this to <laughs> Snowmass summary. Yeah, now the floor is open to the question. Do you know the timeline for the Higgs factory if at all it happens in Formula or is it you have to wait for FCC decision before you? 
I think that's really going to be up to, to P5. So I, I don't expect this P5 to make a decision yes or no on Higgs factory. I expect it to make a decision that says, here's how the US is going to pursue a coherent program which will support uh, a Higgs factory, um, either at FCCEE or in the, in the US. And I would very much want them to be able to be in a position when the European strategy update occurs and there's other developments at CERN for the US to be able to make a rational response. I can't know, I don't know what that rational response would be, but that's, I, I think that will happen. Okay, um, yeah, so I have a questions and a comment. Uh, questions concern, um, like uh, how is the interfacing of the, you know, the, the snow mass process for the particle physics side with the nuclear physics and the astroparticle, I mean, things, beyond collider, beyond. So how's that happened in the process and, you know, sort of. Uh -huh. So uh, she want me to answer that question first. Yeah. So uh, the answer is it is happening, could be better than it is, but one way it's happening is our steering group includes, uh, mem uh, includes people who are formerly uh, heads of the division of astrophysics, astroparticle astrophysics and DPS uh, in APS, excuse me, nuclear physics, accelerator physics, gravitational physics. Um, there were collaborations, especially among the cosmic frontier. Uh, in the case of, you know, astrophysics, there are very close collaborations with those. On the nuclear physics side, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, there are some institutional barriers because in the Department of Energy, nuclear physics is one division and high energy physics is another. So for example, uh, neutrinoless double beta decay, yeah. which is, I think of it as particle physics, uh, but it belongs in some sense to nuclear physics in, uh, in DOE. And so we did have, we invited the um, DOE representatives from nuclear physics to come and, and, and talk to us. And they, they have a lot of goodwill to work together. And I, I, I'm hopeful that with uh, Regina, uh, Ramika at, as, as the head of the division that at that level, there'll, there'll be more coordination. So I think in the process and in the community that coordination can happen. I think there are some issues in st structurally that we have to address. Okay, so comment is just about uh, two slides back. Um, right, I mean, anyway, I think this is something probably will be discussed uh, in the, uh, uh, the round table thing. But as far as uh, part of being the community, I think uh, we should be really no Indian side. I mean, our, our approach should be um, not like plan A and plan B. It should be machine agnostic. I mean, whether it's FCCEE or ILC, CPC or whatever, uh, our, our approach should be more like, you know, wherever the science come and we, we have to be prepared on that matter. So I you. think we'll be discussing that. Yeah, good. I'm curious to know about the stand of your stand regarding the CEPC machine. If it comes out, will you join or? That is a fascinating question uh, that I think will be out of our pay grade. I think it will have more to do likely with the international situation and relationships between the two countries than purely the science. I, I wish I could say it would be otherwise. I think there's the possibility you know, we, in the, if we have the example of the, of the Cold War, we know CERN played a crucial role in uh, as being a bridge between uh, Russian physicists and Western physicists. And so I think we have the opportunity in science if we can navigate the sometimes treacherous international uh, relations waters to, to maintain that connection, those connections between, I've, I've certainly done, for example, a lot of collaboration with physicists in China. I know many people have, that's much more difficult now. I literally can't um, be sure that I can go to China. Actually they're closed right now because of COVID, so no one can go, but uh, you know, or, or, they, or have them come here. Um, but you know, we can continue to maintain contacts. Um, I think it's gonna be driven by things that are outside our control more than than the science. I would like it to be like that was said, you know, wherever the physics is, we go there. But. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so there's more question maybe Hulu in the panel so we can have more discussion during the panel sessions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then now next talk that will be in the Zoom.
and that also this no mass, but that is the accelerator point of view, and it will given by this uh, Vladimir. Uh, Vladimir, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, I can hear you very well. Uh, Do you see my slides? Not yet, just a minute. Yeah, can you make it full screen? It is already full screen. Okay. Okay, maybe the floor is open to you now. Start. Thank you very much. I'm very much honored to, to make this presentation and report about snow mass, uh, significant part of snow mass at the accelerator frontier and uh, our thoughts about future. So I represent uh, three conveners of that uh, frontier, Steve Gurley from Berkeley, Thor Robinheimer from Slack and myself, I'm from Fermilab. Uh, as uh, Shekhar uh, had shown and explained in detail, uh, snow mass is a periodic process. So we go through these cycles and we've, we've, we've gone through them many times already. And they usually start with community planning. So physics community tries to figure out what the science drivers and opportunities uh, every so often. And then uh, kind of summaries of this uh, community discussion go as an input to the P5 panel, as uh, Shakar explained, which is will, will, will take place uh, uh, in FY in 2023. And then uh, recommendations of that panel go to funding agencies. In, in our case, it's a DOE and the uh, National Science Foundation. So basically they control the money and eventually it goes into the budget. And after seven or eight years of hard work, we go through the cycle again. So in 2021, uh, as Sekhar said, so the snow mass process organized by American Physical Society was broken and broken, I would say divided in number of uh, the venues and topics uh, uh, along the, the, the lines of science and technology. Accelerator Frontier was just one of them. So as I said, we had three conveners and the focus of, of the Accelerator Frontier was to understand most important questions for the field of accelerator science and technology, identify promising opportunities and tools to address them, consider mix of large, mid and small scale accelerators as well as R&D, Accelerator R&D, and eventually it all should provide enough information to P5 and uh, that, that's supposed to help them to develop a strategy for the US uh, for high energy physics. So uh, accelerator, the world of accelerator, of course, is quite diverse and we addressed all these uh, uh, topics, uh, first one by one and then, then together. So uh, topics uh, or areas, we call them topical groups, uh, included things like beam physics and accelerator education, accelerators for neutrinos, accelerators for electronic and Higgs factory, uh, Multi-TV colliders, accelerators for physics beyond colliders and rare processes, advanced accelerator concepts like plasma, uh, accelerator technology are indeed like RF, magnets and targets and sources. And as Sakar said, the, 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 the community went, the, the community planning was truly international. In our particular, particular uh, frontier, out of 30 topical group conveners, nine were from outside of the US, from Daisy Sorn, uh, Italy, France, uh, China, or uh, France, and so on. So the goals of all uh, topical groups were uh, formulated as following, so that the overall questions included what accelerators and tools are needed to advance the physics, what is currently available, what are new accelerator facilities could be available on the next decade or next, next decade, and uh, what is the readiness and needed R&D to enable these future opportunities, and what are the time and cost scales and uh, of the R&D and associated test facilities, as well as time and cost scale of these big facilities themselves. So of course, the last two questions are pretty hard and uh, will have a big impact on the strategy development. So exactly for the purpose of addressing them properly, we have created so-called implementation task force to develop a kind of comparative metrics for guidance. Uh, below, I will explain in detail what this implementation task force did. So uh, for at a glance, say the frontier uh, uh, had uh, more than uh, 500 people uh, involved in the say the frontier discussions. About a quarter of them were early career scientists and engineers. Uh, more than 70, uh, closer to 100, actually uh, attended this final meeting in Seattle. Uh, and then there were 63 topical workshops and meetings, eight cross frontier agoras when we got together with representatives from energy frontier, theory frontier. Uh, neutrino frontiers and so on and so forth. So most of them were on uh, uh, specific agoras or basically it's kind of fora uh, discussions uh, on types of colliders, linear, circular, muon, proton, advanced colliders and so on and so forth. Uh, in addition to these uh, topical workshops and meetings, we had a special cross frontier groups uh, where several frontiers joined forces to understand opportunities and challenges 
uh, towards certain type of machine of the future, like key plus and minus colliders, muon colliders, and as I said, implementation task force. Uh, we also communicated with groups uh, which uh, pushed proposals for uh, power upgrade of the Fermilab accelerator complex, so-called 2.4 megawatt uh, complex upgraded Fermilab. So there is a group which uh, pushes that upgrade. And uh, the team that uh, kind of proposed so-called National Future Collider R&D program. So eventually, uh, all these discussions were summarized in more than 250 letters of interest and eventually 221 white papers, so-called white papers. Are Pretty, no, pretty serious documents. Uh, some, some of them are, you know, it's basically between 10 to, to 50, 60 pages long. So, of course, reports of this fora, E plus E minus collider and Mion collider fora, reports of implementation task force, nine topical group summary reports, and at the end, we just finished that accelerator frontier summary report. I will briefly go through this accelerator frontier summary report. And if you look at this report, which is already published in, in archive, uh, it has an introduction. Uh, which explains uh, what has happened since previous P5, as Sekhar said, that, that it took place in 2014. So it describes current uh, SNOMAS 21 process. And then we talk about facilities, uh, particular focus is on multi-megawatt Fermilab complex upgrade uh, and um, opportunities for uh, processes physics, uh, uh, like I, I will describe some of them later on. And then uh, significant uh, focus is given to future uh, energy frontier facilities like Higgs uh, factories, uh, Mion colliders and uh, this proposal for integrated future colliders R&D program. So let me start with accelerators for neutrinos. As you know, we are building a new uh, proton uh, superconducting RF proton LINAC that will have energy of protons of 800 MeV. And uh, LINAC is being built at Fermilab and will greatly uh, uh, increase the uh, intensity available for uh, neutrino experiments at, at Fermilab. It's called PIP2 or Proton Improvement Plan 2. Uh, six countries contribute uh, to, to the project, including India. Shekhar shown some slides uh, explaining where Indian contributions particularly go to. So this webcam shows uh, uh, last morning. Uh, so how, uh, how, how, how bad the weather is in Chicago. Right, so actually the question is what's in, again, we are building this facility. It's supposed to come up operational, this uh, superconducting Linux uh, in, uh, in 2028. 27, 28, the question is what, what's the plan for the 2030s? What will we do? Just operate or do something else? And that, as uh, Shekhar explained, that's where we get input from our, what we call neutrino frontier colleagues. And they push for second phase of the LBNF Dune experiment. So that phase assumes uh, that in order to, you probably see my cursor, in order to get to the physics discoveries, and uh, this is in sigma, three sigma, four sigma, five sigma, in order to get to the five sigma discoveries you know, as soon as possible within kind of next 10 to 12 years. Uh, and as you know, uh, this LBNF Dune project uh, has a direct competition uh, with a similar type of uh, super beams experiment in Japan called uh, Hyper-K. So in order to get faster to these five sigma goals, uh, so the goal, the, the idea is to improve uh, both the experiment and accelerator, so particular accelerator and accelerator power, uh, beam power on the neutrino target, 120 GV beams on the neutrino target, will need to, to, to get improved from 1.2 megawatts, that's the PIP2 goal, to 2.4 megawatts, so a factor of two improvement. Uh, and uh, for that, we have carefully looked uh, what, what's available and where are the opportunities, what, 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 what are the opportunities to, to, to increase that uh, the power and the target. And we figured out that, that it's actually not the highest energy beam that's where we have limitations, but one of the lower energy injectors, one of them called booster, uh, which is fast cycling, rapid cycling synchrotron. That's where we have a bottleneck that limits our number of protons per pulse. And we thought that you know, this booster probably needs to be replaced in order to get to this factor of two improvement in the power. And there are a number of options which we considered <clears throat> for this improvement of the of the basic replacement of, of the booster. One of them is uh, let's replace booster with the modern rapid cycling synchrotron. Uh, and another option is let's replace this uh, booster with another AGV machine, but in this case, linear machine, AGV Linux, which could be could, could augment uh, PIP2 Linux to be finished very soon in, in six years. And also can be used for injection in the Accumulator in and later in the main injector. The main injector will ramp up the energy to 120 GV, and <clears throat> that's the way we get neutrinos produced for the BNF Dune. Of course, there are challenges. First of all, as I mentioned, there is a competition with Japanese uh, 
scientists running Hyper-K experiment and using JPARC beam. And the plot on the right shows that uh, our uh, our current power, uh, power production, power kind of on target uh, production is of course higher than for in Japan, but eventually they also plan power upgrades and want to get significant statistics. <clears throat> another one, another challenge is that it's a relatively short uh, timeline. Uh, the cost of course is quite challenging because uh, any upgrades, accelerate upgrades, especially uh, such significant facilities like Fermi complex, quite costly. Definitely, we should consider how uh, what kind of changes will need to take place in the rest of the complex, not just in the booster, but also say in the main injector. Uh, how how our targets will behave? We know that uh, we have significant uh, technical limitations, uh, uh, power limitations for, for beam targets, and uh, frankly speaking, we don't have 2.4 megawatt targets yet, so we have only like one megawatt capable targets. And of course, there are uh, various risks related to performance, mostly uh, uh, kind of uh, kind of described when uh, to, to phenomena leading to beam losses of all kinds and of course at high energy beam losses are quite dangerous and those are instabilities losses at injection losses in the collimation system space charge effects and so on and so forth <clears throat> if you look uh, beyond albinev dune so definitely uh, phase one will continue until uh, full completion in late 2020s early 2030s uh, at that point U.S. could pursue uh, LBNF phase two or, or maybe and energy frontier uh, facilities. There are multiple global options exist for Higgs factories, which you already heard from SECAR, CILC, FCCE, CPC, CLIC. There is, we, we also noted that the interest in the mid-TF colliders, for example, one TV colliders, two TV and three TV colliders has declined because of uh, LHC has covered already that the uh, uh, center of mass energy scales and uh, the, the, the push is now for 10 plus TV. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in, increasingly important become issues uh, related to carbon footprint and environmental efficiency. We also noted that uh, if LBNF phase two uh, will be built, so it will provide excellent infrastructure for strong muon collider R&D program. And we also thought that in the future, we need to de develop technology to provide potential improvements in for various machines in, and the various technologies like RF, superconducting RF, but so far we are lacking accelerated design and we should, we'll need to work on that. As Sekar said, uh, the, the, the uh, situation in the global high energy physics is quite complicated, in particular European and Asian milestones, so decisions will definitely impact uh, developments in the US and, and vice versa, by the way, right? And uh, we need to continue R&D. So uh, I switch from uh, kind of accelerated for neutrinos to colliders. Uh, Higgs and uh, factories and uh, energy frontier colliders. That's where, again, bringing up again this notion of implementation task force. The task force was charged to develop uh, to develop uh, uh, metrics and processes to facilitate comparison between collider projects, between Higgs and factories, between lepton colliders with uh, three TV center of mass energy, lepton and hadron colliders with 10 plus TV center of mass energy per parton, uh, particular attention was given to Fermilab site fillers and uh, another type of colliders, it's energy hadron, uh, sorry, lepton hadron colliders like electron proton. And we, we've broken up uh, this uh, task force in the four subgroups. Uh, some of us uh, addressed the physics reach and beam parameters, uh, others thought about size, complexity, power, and environmental comparison of projects uh, in, in that on that front. Technical risk readiness and R&D required was uh, considered by another subgroup and cost and schedule by the, the last one. The task force itself consisted of 15 people. Uh, so uh, uh, most of them are people who built accelerators. So combined experience of these 15, 15 people is uh, 20 big accelerate, large accelerators built over the past three decades. So uh, basically these people know what, what does it take to build a big facility. Uh, and in addition to accelerator experts, we had uh, representatives from Energy Frontier, Dmitry Denisov and Minakshin Narain, and Theory Frontier, Leontao Vank, in order to, to help us to properly formulate uh, physics, uh, physics goals of, of uh, big accelerator facilities of the future. So, of course, they published the report. It's a comprehensive report, has a lot of physics consideration. For example, this physics production for different machines, ILC, uh, C FCCE, CRC, and so on and so forth. Uh, is presented on the plot like that, where you see how many atta uh, each machine can produce a year, uh, depending on center of mass energy. Uh, 
uh, and as a already mentioned several times the number of uh, concepts uh, how to how to obtain uh, particle collisions and produce Higgs particles and study them so uh, implementation task force considered 10 uh, which is a significant number some of them are well known like FCC, EE, CPC, ILC and CLIC, uh, C cube uh, is, is less known but still people heard about it but there are others for example uh, colliders built on uh, circular uh, energy recovery Linux or uh, linear colliders built on the idea of recycling the energy, or a field-based gamma-gamma collider that can produce uh, collisions at the square root of S, uh, exactly needed for, for S-channel uh, uh, Higgs production. Same can be done with the muon collider Higgs factory. So this concept has been considered. Uh, particular focus, as I said, was given to uh, colliders, which Higgs factors, which potentially can fit the uh, Fermi site. One of them is 16 kilometers long, uh, circular plasma colliders and uh, uh, so-called cold copper colliders c cube uh, or helen helen is a traveling wave superconducting rf collider it's kind of evolution of ilc uh, and uh, this uh, the, the later two feed fermi lab site and uh, they, they there are 250 gv uh, variants uh, feed feed uh, along the diagonal they are approximately seven kilometers long so and uh, the summary of implementation task force is actually it's extensive document where, where uh, as I said, many, many options for various colliders considered. And you, uh, most of this findings summarized in the tables like that. For example, look into the table related to Higgs factories. What is shown here on the left is circular colliders, linear plus colliders, CRL based colliders and S channel colliders, right? So uh, for each of these options, so of course, center of mass energy is closer to 0.25, except for its channel ones. Then luminosity is given PIP for each machine. Luminosity is provided by proponents. And then uh, what uh, uh, implementation task force kind of uh, discussed and came up with consensus on years of pre-project R&D required and years to first physics. Uh, uh, then the column number one, two, three, four, five is about cost range. In 2021 billion dollars and you see the range is indeed it's kind of uh, with about 60 percent 50 percent accuracy uh, and then electric power consumption given in the last column so and different machines fare differently for example look into the column number two luminosity pip at the higgs energy in the units of 10 to the 34 and one can see that the highest numbers come in into the rl based uh, uh, for the rl based colliders erl it's energy recovery linux they allow to very efficiently use electric power in order to provide collisions. And indeed, uh, uh, so the luminosity can be enormously high, higher than FCC or, or linear colliders for sure. But if you look into the year uh, years of uh, pre-project R&D, then you see that the, 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 the most ready in some sense, requiring less R&D time are circle colliders, FCC, CPC, uh, ILC, and, and CLIC. Right, others are not not uh, kind of that progressed. C cube, for example, requires three to five years of R and D. If in, again technically limited timeline, uh, other machines require much more. Uh, years to first physics, the uh, kind of champion obviously is ILC because it's very well prepared, you know, design wise machine. So it can be built in like 12, 12 under twelve years uh, since decision is made to go ahead. So all these years to first physics are again in technically driven schedule after time of decision to proceed, right? Again, uh, ILC is the, again, in the, in the, the champion, but other machines like FCC, EE, CPC can be finished in 13 to 18 years after decision is made to proceed. So uh, very important, of course, is the, the cost of the machines and the, the, the most compact and the smallest ones because of low energy of, of the beams are uh, as channel Higgs factories like uh, gamma gamma Higgs factory or muon collider Higgs factory. Uh, the next to them are linear colliders, all of them, ILC, CLIC, uh, low energy CLIC, C cube and Helen, and their range is seven to $12 billion. And Fermilab Higgs factory, given it's uh, relatively small, it's seven to 12 factors. Other, uh, other machines are much more expensive. Of course, very important nowadays is power consumption. And power consumption is the lowest for gamma gamma and uh, uh, ERL based colliders and the next uh, next package uh, with the approximately 100 to 150 megawatt required side power are linear colliders like ILC, CLIC, CQ, and Helen. Other colliders are much more power hungry, right? 
So of course, uh, all these discussions were extremely nuanced. So what's given in the table is just high level view of uh, what's uh, of the summary. For example, if you look in the cost of different Higgs factors, you can see that implementation task force uh, came up with actually, it's not just the range, for example, between 12 to $18 billion, but also the kind of shaded shaded uh, edges of this of these bars indicate that where probability of uh, either much lower cost than 12 for example in this case of FCC or much higher cost and the cost can can go up to like 20 24 billion dollars for FCC uh, again again it's not as probable as, as in the mean value but still right so uh, if you switch gears to high energy colliders, right, those are lepton colliders, which can operate uh, between three to 10, maybe 15 TV center of mass energies and uh, proton proton colliders. Again, there is a physics case briefly described in the limitation task force. Of course, it doesn't substitute energy frontier findings, which are much more detailed. So here we just given our main physics summaries. And uh, we looked into the eight options for high energy lepton colliders that includes ILC, 3TV ILC, 3TV CLIP, 3TV C cube, 3TV uh, energy recovery linear collider, neon collider in the range of up to 14 TV, and laser driven colliders, which can potentially reach energies, uh, at least on paper, up all the way up to 15 TV. So for these colliders, we also thought uh, what, where, where the opportunities to save and definitely reusing infrastructure is one way of, of saving because you will see the cost is one of the major uh, considerations for these colliders. For example, uh, reusing infrastructure of sewer is, is quite important, can be used or using infrastructure at Fermilab for, for example, for muon collider. Uh, also, it's a great advantage for, for some of these proposals, right? So uh, multi-TV HH and EH colliders included uh, FCC HH, SPPC, a collider which was proposed uh, by one of uh, uh, scientists in the US, actually a small group, uh, is collider in DC to place a, a, a 500 TV collider, proton-proton collider in the Gulf of Mexico. That collider would have 1900 kilometers circumference and should float underwater, right? It's of course looks fantastic, but we again, we seriously consider that uh, that proposal. Also, we have here listed LHEC, FCCH, and the CPC, SPPC collision. Basically, if, if two machines, electron and, and proton machines, are placed in the uh, Chinese uh, tunnel of CPC. Right. So, again, similar table for this uh, beyond Higgs factor is machines. So, those are CLIC, ILC, Muon Collider, uh, a 3 TV, 10 TV, Muon Collider, and FCCHH. And you see that uh, uh, situation is not as uh, optimistic there, at least from the point of view of the of this implementation task force. Uh, and uh, particularly what kind of, and I would say unimpresses us that significant power requirements for all these machines, for linear colliders, 3TV or the 3TV linear colliders like ILC and CLIC, the, the power consumption goes to 400, 550 uh, megawatts. Uh, for FCCHH is a closer to 600 megawatts. For this collider and DC, it's way beyond the one petawatt, uh, well, sorry, one terawatt. Uh, and uh, the, the most compact, the most, uh, let's say, cost efficient uh, seem to be Mion Collider versions, 3TV, 6TV, or 10TV uh, versions of the Mion Collider. They require less energy. Uh, but uh, as you can see, for example, in the column uh, re related to pro pre-project R&D, so it requires significant R&D more than 10 years. Still uh, estimate is that the, the, the low energy version can be built in 19 to 24 years after the decision to proceed. Uh, high energy mean colliders might take a little bit longer. So uh, as I said, power, power consumption of these colliders is, is extremely important uh, factor nowadays when cost of energy, cost of electric power goes up everywhere. Uh, that's why different types of colliders being kind of compared on the equal footing, for example, luminosity per megawatt power. So, and circular E plus and minus colliders, extremely efficient at low energies, for example, at, at uh, uh, Z pole, but become less and less efficient in terms of luminosity production at high energies. ERL-based colliders do have some advantage, but again, that advantage disappears closer to one TV or so of center of mass energy. Uh, Hadron colliders, uh, quite, I would say, in the middle of the pack, but with energy increasing from you know 50 to 100 to beyond uh, TV, center of mass energy, due to synchrotron radiation, become uh, less and less efficient as well. So the only 
type of machines which shows a potential kind of improvement with energy, basically energy efficiency grows with energy is muon collider. That's why uh, a lot of interest is uh, expressed uh, you know, by accelerator experts and um, our physics colleagues to, to that type of colliders. So uh, our accelerator frontier message for large scale facility uh, has a number of points. First of all, that the options for the next US engagement include intensity or in energy frontier machines. We need an integrated future collider R&D program, a focused R&D program in the Office of High Energy Physics to engage in the design and coordinate development of next generation collider projects. We didn't do much of that, so but we need to consider over the next, I would say, 10 years, eight years uh, in detail, uh, such a potential future machine says, uh, what can be done about ILC, CLIC, FCCEE, C-Cube and Helen, and multi-TV Mion Collider. Uh, we also need to keep an active R&D program in labs and universities aimed at the general accelerator R&D. So uh, to this initiative, so we said that the future colliders R&D program needs to be established. In the past, uh, the budget for uh, you know, advanced technology and R&D in the DOE Office of High Energy Physics included uh, three types of uh, investments. One is investment in support of accelerated test facilities. Another one was what we used to call, it's in red, directed R&D and general accelerated R&D. The directed R&D was uh, towards facilities of the future, like ILC, LHC, and there was a US LARP program and Mion Collider. But after uh, considerations of previous uh, P5, so that it was decided that we need to kind of um, basically reassess this uh, directed R&D programs and eventually budget of this kind of directed R&D effort uh, went down to zero. So right now we have only general accelerated R&D and supporting accelerated test facilities. So the proposal formulated by a uh, group of enthusiasts calling for restoration of the directed R&D program in the Office of High Energy Physics budget uh, for future colliders. And that should be an integrated program. It should consider several collider concepts Love in it. the US. And I'm finishing uh, in the in US and abroad. Minutes. Five minutes, yes. And we should, it should include design and R&D effort. Finally, uh, speaking uh, about R&D effort uh, over the, for the next decade, so we think uh, uh, we should concentrate on uh, development of multi-megawatt targets for PIP3 for this 2.4 megawatt uh, upgrade of the complex uh, for multi-megawatt muon collider proton driver. So uh, magnets uh, uh, should be developed for, for future colliders and rapid cycling synchrotrons like 16 Tesla dipoles, uh, 40 Tesla solenoids and 1000 Tesla per second fast cycling uh, magnets as needed for, for example, for Mion Collider. Uh, there is significant challenge in developing more efficient superconducting or even normal conducting like cool copper uh, RF uh, and the new materials uh, uh, and efficient RF sources and wake field accelerators. Uh, research should concentrate on the collider quality beams, how to generate these uh, beams which potentially could be used for colliding uh, facilities. So, of course, on top of everything, we need to continue developing accelerator and beam physics. Uh, particular of interest are uh, methods to control uh, acceleration of high intensity and high brightness beams, high performance computing, and design integration and optimization of future facilities. So, with that, I would like to thank you. Thanks, particular thanks to Chapon, uh, special th thanks to our organizers and the Accelerator Frontier to Group Conveners, Liaisons, and ITF Chair, and for our conveners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, thanks for your excellent overview on the future accelerator front. Yeah, now floor is open to the question. If any question. Hello, Vladimir. Thank you. Yes. Very inspiring talk as usual verse for an award, perhaps, should have a award for the best talk. Um, <laughs> I have a question uh, for the cost estimate. I guess these cost numbers are US cost numbers and not the European uh, counting when you made Absolutely, it. absolutely. So uh, the, the report has a, a kind of extended footnotes explaining everything. For example, you see that there is a cost range Particular attention should be paid that this is for 2021 billion dollars. Uh, accounting is US accounting, but these numbers are given. Uh, US accounting means you account for everything, including like management, uh, including like pre project RD cost, and so on and so forth. But it's the cost range is given without escalation, taking into account escalation, inflation, 
right? And without contingency in the fully blown US methodology. So when people kind of talk about like cost of, uh, you know, LBNF Dune, for example, you take into account everything, including inflation, including uh, what we call contingency. Contingency, for example, is a big factor of the order of 30, 35, sometimes 40%. So these contingency escalation are not in these numbers. It just cost range in the bare, I would say, dollars plus 2021 dollars. Yes, Frank, you're right. Okay. It's American accounting. Yeah, Shabun. I'm good. Okay. Hi, Vladimir. It's a great <laughs> talk. As you know, you. in the last P5, uh, when I just came in and joined Formula from from Europe, yeah, Muon Collider was completely decimated. Any kind of an R and D on Muon was slowly brought down to zero pretty much. But uh, so I wonder in this uh, snow mass, uh, what what would you sense the temperature of particle physicists, not accelerator people, about mm -hmm. uh, their interest in the muon collider? Because now mm -hmm. technology has advanced. We have shown muon cooling through ionization cooling. And now recently at Fermilab, we have done mm -hmm. optical cooling. So what would you say the temperature in the interest in muon colliders from particle physics community, not accelerator. yes, yes, yes. I would say the temperature is uh, uh, is worrisomely high. It's actually boiling. <laughs> if in the past seven years you would see that the you know number of accelerated publications on muon colliders always was you know like five, six, seven, five, four, five, six, and so on and so forth. Uh, theory and physics papers related to muon colliders were essentially non-existent. So between zero to one publication a year over the past, I would say, seven years, that's where we were. But uh, since after Granada, European strategy, and uh, recently when SNOMAS started, we see a real explosion. Just in the past eight months, we have uh, 60, 63 publications on muon collider physics in all variations. So people are so much interested. There is so much, uh, so much kind of you know, affection to muon collider uh, that you know. I, I personally would, would like to kind of keep keep the temperature a little bit down and, and you know, make people to be a little bit more realistic. But right now, as as, as I said, it's super hot. Super hot topic and a lot of interest. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have just one small question, Vladimir. So there is a lots of R and D in the different accelerator front. Uh, mm -hmm. is, do you have sufficient manpower for all this? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, the answer is uh, uh, for for no, we don't have sufficient manpower for to do everything. Uh, everything we want. That's why prioritization of R&D is required. And that we hope will be part of uh, P5 discussions uh, because we need to concentrate on, uh, on certain areas so we can develop everything. Uh, moreover, we are thinking ahead of how this kind of prioritization can be done and still be a little bit more inclusive. Uh, and one of the proposals is, for example, why don't we consider uh, and develop designs of uh, future colliders like CQ or Helen uh, or, or Mion Collider jointly. So why don't we form one group of people which would look into all, for example, like three or four different concepts uh, that will save the, you know, the time and moreover, will we'll assure more or less uniform approach to, to, to the design issues. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So we don't have, uh, you know, luxury of having, you know, as many people and as much time as, uh, as we wish. Uh, but still, we have uh, no hard deadlines. Again, hope is that by the next P5, around 2030, 2035, or oh, sorry, 32, uh, we should have enough information so our community can make informed decisions about what way to proceed. So what exactly can be built and should be built. Okay. Thank you, Vladimir. Yeah. Thank you. So with this, we end this middle of the, we are in the middle of the sessions. We will have a tea break and we'll come back 1140. Oh, thanks, Vladimir. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure.